Continue to stand as we read the Word of God this morning. I'm reading from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So be affectionately desirous, uh, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. When all I see is the battle, come on. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory When all I see are the mountains You see a mountain And as 
as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. Come on. I know you know it. Come on. So when I find out, come on, with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the view. You see the empty tomb. So when I find I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. His almighty fortress, and you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, and you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, my good fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Come on. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. Come on. My hands lift high. No God. Come on. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. together 
worthy and all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sin became poor. Here I am to worship. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together loving, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know. I'll never know how much it costs. To see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never. pray together. Heavenly Father, we've gathered and we've just sung about your sovereignty and your goodness, but we've also sung about the dark nights of the souls that we go through and how you stepped out of the light and into the darkness. And Lord, I can't help but think that there are some of us here this morning that are either experiencing one of those dark nights of the soul or know someone who is. And so, God, those, those loved ones, those friends, those family members, those people in church, they weigh heavily on our hearts right now, and we just, in the quiet of our hearts, lift their names before you. And we pray, God, that you would minister to them and that you'd minister to us as we minister to them or that you'd minister to us, Lord, by your spirit as only you perhaps know that we need. But, God, we thank you that you, our triune God, is not only seated in the heavenlies, but is also with us, even as Jesus promised, I am with you till the end of the ages by the power of your spirit. So God, we pray that you would meet with us, that you would expose parts of us that need to trust. Lord, there can be a million miles between our head and our hearts. And God, even though we declare your sovereignty, we are prone to wander. We're, we're prone to wring our hands and act like you're not sovereign. So God, would you remind us even right now that you are in control that you provide, that you love us, that in Christ you're for us, and that you have done everything necessary for us to stand 
fully forgiven, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus even right now. God, we pray for our gathering that you would allow your word to go forth in power. We pray, Lord, that it would yield in us not only head knowledge, but obedience. We pray, God, for our classes, our professors, students, faculty, staff. We pray, Lord, that you would use Gateway Seminary for your glory and for our good and for the good of your churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Reuben, for leading us in worship and welcome to chapel here at Gateway Seminary. My name is Adam Groza. I serve as Vice President of Enrollment and Student Services, and we are glad that you're here. Um, the President, Dr. Jeff Orge, is in Egypt. Egypt. Pretty cool, right? I know. I know. Uh, and so he is there, and we are praying for him and the, the group that's there. They're seeing some important historical sites and getting to know one another. And, um, but this morning, we're privileged to gather for chapel, and I have some announcements, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. So in terms of announcements, the IMB Missions College is February 23rd through 25th, and that's going to be here in chapels featuring Dr. Paul Chitwood, the president of the IMB. So we are honored to have that. This is no doubt going to be a full chapel that day. And so this is going to be a hands-on training event for pastors, church leaders, mission trip participants, and any church members who are engaged in missions. So that's the IMB Missions College, February 23rd through 25th. On February 16th, Bart Barber, the president of the SBC, is going to be in chapel, and then we're going to be doing a leadership lunch with Dr. Barber. So you're going to need to sign up on Eventbrite for that, which is really easy. Just go to Eventbrite, type in Gateway Seminary, and you can sign up. It is free, but you have to sign up for that event. And then today, after chapel, we're having a leadership lunch in the Graves Room featuring Dr. Don Dent and Dr. Rich Johnstone talking about missions and church planning. If you did not sign up for that, there's about 10 seats left. So whoever gets there the fastest, no, I'm joking, don't do that. Calmly, after chapel, walk over there and just say, hey, can I have one of those 10 seats? And I'm sure that we've got space for you. Well, our chapel speaker today is, well, it's kind of an interesting story. So you might have come today expecting to hear Dr. Hans Dilbeck, the president of Guidestone. We found out from Dr. Dilbeck yesterday that apparently there's a storm in like everywhere else in America, except for here, look outside. No storm here in Southern California, but there is a substantial snowstorm, I guess, or substantial for Texas. I guess like the smallest amount of snow just shuts down the entire state of Texas. Um, but uh, he had to cancel because his flight was canceled, it was unavoidable. And so we are very thankful to have in chapel today Dr. Jonathan Jarbo. He's our friend. He's a trusted and uh, just faithful ministry leader. He's president of the Baptist Foundation of California. He was elected in 2020. Uh, before that, he was pastor of Pathway Church, and he's held other staff positions at churches in Vacaville and San Jose. He holds a number of degrees, uh, including from Gateway Seminary. He's been married to Tammy since 1987. They have three grown children and six grand, three grown children and six grandchildren. And he is going to be preaching a sermon this morning about resting in the Lord. It's going to bless you. Would you give a warm gateway welcome to Dr. Jonathan Jarbo? Well, thank you. It is a privilege to be here. Reuben, thanks for leading us in worship this morning with your team. Uh, just enjoyed uh, worshiping with you. And uh, Dr. Groza, thank you for the opportunity to bring the word this morning. Uh, yesterday morning, early out in the lobby, uh, Dr. Groza, we attend church together. We live uh, in the same community together. And he came to me yesterday morning and said, I preach Sunday at our church. And he said, hey, something to the effect of, you know, enjoy the message Sunday. We all need to hear it. And then he followed up with a little caveat. But to be honest, I probably won't apply a lot of it or something like that. <laughs> and then he said, you can use that in a sermon illustration later if you'd like to. <laughs> and then about an hour later, I got a text from him that said, our chapel speaker's canceled 
would you be willing to preach the sermon you preached Sunday in chapel? So I went home and told my wife this story, and she said, well, Adam is getting his second chance. So <clears throat> I love Gateway, and I'm a proud graduate and grateful to be with you this morning. As Adam said, I want to talk this morning about resting, about slowing down, about busyness and the pace of life that we face. There's a false image about those of us that live in Southern California. It's propagated by those of us that don't live here. And the image is there's palm trees, the ocean calm waves, and everybody that lives in Southern California is pretty chilled, laid back, and it's an easy life. Those of us that live here know the pace of life in Southern California is much different than, than that. In fact, we're a haven for workaholics. We're a haven for people who have their kids in four sports, theater, the Y, and a whole bunch of other things, and life is out of control. In fact, some in our society would even say that they prefer work over recreation. I think those people are a little messed up. I don't know what's up with them, but they're a little crazy. Uh, every once in a while, and as a pastor, I would hear stories from people. They, they say it sort of braggadociously. I haven't taken a vacation in five and a half years. You've heard that. What's wrong with those people? You know, wake up. Uh, we are a haven for people that are way too busy, for workaholics, people that, that our lives just always seem out of control. Let me do an informal question here. I did this with our church Sunday. You might be too busy if. Um, here's the first one. You might be too busy if. You're always in a hurry. Check. Ouch. Number two, you might be too busy if you use your days off to catch up on work. Check. Ouch. You might be too busy if people often tell you to slow down. Check. Ouch. You might be too busy if you feel guilty when you relax. Or you might be too busy if you do laundry cleaning or handle the bills for your family when everybody else is gone to sleep. I said that to my wife, and she said, well, if you have children, that's the only time you can do some of those things. So, so I get that. My wife added a couple for me. She said, you ignore people. Yeah, you, our wife added them. You, you're too busy because you ignore people to check email on your phone, or you allow your phone to interrupt conversations with family and people that are important in your life. So how do we slow down? How do we live a balanced life like God intended for us to live? Let me read our text this morning. It's out of Psalm chapter 23, just three verses. Most of you could quote it with me, all six verses. But since we have a variety of translations, you probably read out of. Let me read Psalm chapter 23. If you have a Bible or digital device, use open it to Psalm 23. I want to read the first three verses. I'll read out of the ESV translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God wants us to slow down. Even reading that at a slow, moderate pace for some just brings a sense of calm and helps us recognize the fact we need to slow down. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to slow down, to relax, maybe even recreate with your family. Now let me clarify, I'm not advising being lazy. I'm not advocating that you shouldn't provide for your family. I'm not advocating that you should be irresponsible. The key is balance in life. Now before we look at this passage a little more in detail, uh, a few of you know me. You know that my wife and I, Tammy, we go fast and hard. But over the years, there's been four things that, that we have done in our lives, just a rhythm that we've built into our lives that, is, that have helped us with this. And I want to share it, and then we'll look at the passage of Scripture. The first thing we've done is we begin nearly every day reading God's Word. 
We've done this for 30 plus years. We modeled it for our kids this morning at about 6.30. I was at our kitchen table with a cup of coffee reading God's word nearly every day. Second thing we do is we exercise, <clears throat> excuse me, regularly. We get up and ride our bikes early or we take a walk in the evening or we go for a hike on the weekend. We exercise regularly. Thirdly, we protect one day a week as our Sabbath. Now, those of you that are in ministry, your pastors, your professors, you often preach on Sunday. Sunday's not always a good Sabbath. For us, for many years, our Sabbath was on Friday because I preached often on Sunday, and I would protect that day. And finally, Tammy and I build recreation into our lives on a regular basis. And when we fail to do these things, verse 2 of Psalm chapter 23 uh, comes to roost in our lives because the psalmist says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Key word, makes. Sometimes God has to make us slow down. Some of you can recognize that or say amen to that because he's done that in your life. God, in Psalm 23, is referring to rest, recreation, slowing down, having some balance in our lives. He doesn't want you to be so busy that you don't have time for the other things that should be more important than your career and the busyness of life. A CNN poll recently said that 60% of Americans would like to slow down and relax more but don't know how. Another poll I read just a week ago said that 55% of American workers don't use all of their vacation each year. Today we're working more and often enjoying life less. So how do we slow down? I want to give you four truths that I believe come from Psalm chapter 23. Here's the first one. The first thing we need to do is to trust God to take care of us. I've got to learn to trust God to take care of me. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. We've got to allow God to shepherd and lead us rather than thinking we have to run the whole world on our own. For those of you that are control freaks like me, this is difficult. You know, sheep trust and rely on their shepherd. One of the reasons we're so busy and overworked is because we confuse our work with our worth. And we think we have to work, work, work in order to have worth in our lives. Work has very little to do with our work has very little to do with our worth. I'm worthy and you're worthy because we are made in the image of God Almighty. And when we understand that, and we learn to live as God, we learn to live with God as our shepherd. That's when we realize where our true worth comes from. That's what gives our lives value. When we meet somebody, we discover their name, and then what's the next question we ask? What do you do? I do this. What do you do? It's because we often confuse our worth with our work, but our worth comes from who we are made in the image of God. You'll never be able to accomplish enough to feel worthy enough. You'll never, to prove, you'll never be able to prove your worth by staying busy. We need to realize what God thinks about us, what God says about us. James chapter 1, verse 18 in the New Century Version says, God decided to give us life through the word of truth so that we might, so that we might be the most important of all the things he has made. You read Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we recognize we're at the height of God's creation. You don't have to prove your worth. You were made by God in His image, and that makes you inherently valuable. Don't spend your life spinning the wheels trying to win the approval of others. You don't need the approval of others. You need to realize how valuable you are to God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, said this. I'll read out of the living, paraphrase, the living Bible. Jesus said, look at the birds. They don't worry about what to eat. They don't need to sow or reap to store up food, for your heavenly Father feeds them, and you are far more valuable to him than they are. If God notices when a little bird falls to the ground and takes care of all the birds, don't you think he'll take care of us? Let me give you three truths. You'll never on this earth completely understand how much God loves you. We study the scripture. 
We learn who God is, and we try to understand how much God loves us, but we'll never completely understand that on this earth. Here's the second truth. There's nothing that you can ever do on this earth to make God love you more than he already does. And the converse of that is there's nothing that you can do that will ever make God love you any less than he already does. God's love isn't based on our performance, on how much you do or don't do, or how busy you are or how busy you aren't. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16, in the good news uh, paraphrase says this. It's God speaking. I can never forget you. I've written your name on the palms of my hands. Jesus died on the cross. They nailed him to a cross. And those nail scar hands is where your name is permanently written. He can never forget how much he loves us. And we never want to forget how much he loves us by what he did on the cross. Here's the second truth. If I want to slow down in life, if I want to have balance in life and rest in who God is and who he's made me to be, then I have to learn to be content. The second half of verse 1, just four words, says, I shall not want. Let those four words seek in. Those four words are difficult for us in our Western world because we're driven for more and more and more. That's the Western way of living, to get more, to work harder. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 12, in the Good News uh, paraphrase, translation says, all of us should eat and drink and enjoy what we have worked for. It's God's gift. Can you be so preoccupied with getting more that you don't enjoy what God has already blessed you with? Of course. Can you be so busy trying with the desire to acquire more and more that you don't enjoy what God's already blessed you with? Of course. Some of you have lived in other parts of the world. Many of you have traveled to other parts of the world. We live in homes that are far nicer than the overwhelming majority of what the world lives in. We live in mansions compared to what most of the world has for a home or shelter. And yet some of us rarely enjoy them because we go, 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 and we're rarely home. We're going at 100 miles an hour either with work or with our kids' activities, and there always seems to be a desire to get more and to do more. Often we're trying to keep up with neighbors or acquaintances we don't even know, not realizing we're trying to, we're, we're trying to keep up with what they have or what they do, not realizing maybe last month they refinanced their home and took all their equity out to buy the toy you see or to go on the vacation you're envying. Or they filed for bankruptcy a month ago and you have no idea and you want to keep up with what they're doing or what they have. Maybe you've heard this, this, this phrase before, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. And when we live like this, we inevitably, inevitably the relationships that we should value the most are what suffers. That's not the way God wants us to live. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6 in the Good News translation says, it is better to have only a little with peace of mind than to be busy all the time. See, the greatest things in life aren't things. For most of us, the older we become, the more we understand stuff doesn't really matter. In fact, like some of you, uh, I've been at the bedside of dozens of people who've taken their last breath as a pastor. I've been with them and their family, and not once has somebody said, hey, can you go check my 401k before I take my last breath? The stuff we'd, we've acquired in life doesn't matter at that point. What people want in their last moments of life is they want their family close by, their loved ones, those they care about. And the things they often say are, I wish we had spent more time together. They never say, I wished I would have worked harder and earned more so I could leave you more. What matters is our relationships in life. Here's the third truth. If I want to slow down, if I want to rest in who God's made me to be, 
I've got to learn to keep my career, my work in check. And what do I mean by this? What I mean is I've got to make a conscious decision to make time for other things besides my career, my work. Me personally, all of my life, I've had to work to keep this area of my life in balance. Early on in my years in ministry, I periodically would say I'm a borderline workaholic. And finally, one time my wife said to me when no one else was around, she said, you're a liar. She said, you're a workaholic. You're not a borderline workaholic. Stop saying that. It's an area that I've had to struggle with. Verse 2 in Psalm 23 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. God will force us to slow down if we don't keep our lives in balance. For me, I have to decide how many hours I realistically want to spend working each week, and I have to stick to it. I, all, of my, all of my work career have had to schedule time for myself, for time alone with God, even for time with my family, to protect it. These are the other priorities in my life that are really more important than work and a career than the busyness of life. Keeping your career in check is especially important for two groups of people. Those that are self-employed, this is extremely important for, because when you're self-employed and you own and run a business, you never walk away from it. It's always with you 24-7. The second group of people that this applies to are the majority of the people in this room, and that is those of us in ministry that lead organizations that lead ministries because we're always on call. We're always on. And it's hard to let go and walk away and secure time for our family and relationships that matter. Ecclesiastes 10.15 in the good news paraphrase. My wife doesn't like this because she doesn't like this word. It says, only someone too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. And I like this particular translation because it's in my face. If I'm working all the time, I'm just not that bright. This is one of God's top 10, by the way. Exodus chapter 20 says, You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. God says take one day a week off every week, even in the Genesis account of creation. On the seventh day, God rested. It's the model God set for us. It's one of the top ten. In fact, this idea of taking time off and having a Sabbath is so important that God put it up there with things like don't commit adultery and don't murder. That's how important this one is. Every seventh day, you take a day off. If you're not taking a day off, you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. The Bible calls this a Sabbath. Sabbath simply means day of rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus talks about the Sabbath, said the Sabbath was made to benefit man, not the other way around. In the book of Colossians, says not to get tied up with legalistic rules about a certain day. What you do on your Sabbath and the fact that you have a Sabbath is most important. So what do you do on the Sabbath? Let me give you three options or three things I think you should do on the Sabbath. Number one, you should rest. Rest your physical body. If you don't rest your physical body on a regular basis, it will make a decision to rest on its own through sickness, through injury, through a health crisis. You feel guilty when you relax? Jesus didn't. Are you busier than Jesus? Is what you're doing more important than what Jesus did? Take a day to rest your physical body. Here's the second thing to do on the Sabbath. Find out whatever recharges you. You can do it on the Sabbath. Whatever recharges you emotionally. My wife and I are very different. For me, I get energized and recharged by being with people. 
for years on Sunday, I'd preach, and then after service, I'd be out on the patio. I'd be looking around, okay, who's out there? Who can we go to lunch with? Who, you know, where's the next party? And my wife would say, can we just go home and do nothing? Figure out whatever recharges you and do that on your Sabbath. If you need time away, take time away. If you need time with the important people in your life, if that's what recharges you, then figure out a way in the Sabbath to do that. If, if, if it's getting together with close friends, then do that to recharge your emotions. Third thing you should do on the Sabbath is make sure you refocus your time with God at least once a week. The Bible calls it worship. A moment ago, Reuben and the team led us in worship. Worship brings things into perspective. Worship gets us in tune, in line with what God wants to say to us. You have more energy to deal with the problems in life when you have got your life in tune with God. You also need time alone with God on the Sabbath. You need time alone with God every day, but you need time alone with God on your Sabbath. If you're too busy for God, either daily or in your Sabbath, you get this, you're, you're too busy. Little children don't like to rest, right? Those of you that are parents of little kids, they don't like to rest, right? I mean, when you get older, you're like, man, I wish I could nap. When you're a child, you're like, I don't want to nap. My wife on Wednesdays has our six-month-old granddaughter, our one-month-old granddaughter, and our four-year-old grandson. The six-month-old shows up at 6.15 in the morning, and I go, oh, hon, I got to get to my office. You know? And she has them till 5 p.m. And on Wednesday, she's exhausted. Our, our six-month-old granddaughter doesn't like to lay down and rest. Yesterday, my wife told me she tried to get her rest. She wouldn't. Finally, she put her in the crib. She was crying. And, in, and the cries were, you know, she cried for a minute. Her head was bobbing. And she fell asleep sitting up in the crib and just fell forward and slept for like an hour and a half sitting up. When we're immature, we resist rest. It's a mark of immaturity to resist rest. If you're always working and never taking time to rest, you're not only breaking one of the Ten Commandments, you're just proving to the rest of the world that you're immature. Sheep don't like to rest, by the way. They sleep about four hours every 24-hour period, give or take. They often sleep standing up. He makes me lie down. Has God ever had to make you lie down? There's been two times in my life God has forced me to lie down. In 2011, um, God forced me to lie down with a very significant cycling accident. And for three months, I was laid up and couldn't walk for about six weeks. And God got my attention because I was going way too fast, way too hard. And he used that situation to get my attention. Now, I'm a slow learner. That was 2011. In 2017, God forced me to lay down again. In 2017, I had complex spine surgery. And for three months, I was at home. For three months, I didn't go to my office. For three months, I didn't preach. For three months, I didn't do anything except rest. I'm a slow learner. I get it. Hopefully, uh, I've learned from those experiences. If you don't slow down, God will make you lie down. Here's the fourth truth, and we'll wrap up with this. Rest in God's peace. This gets at the very root of busyness and stress. You need more than just time away or time off to rest and recharge you need to rest in God's peace. You need to daily spend time with God and make sure your relationship with Him is ongoing. Verse 3 says, He restores my soul. He does that daily through the renewing of our mind like Paul talked about in Romans 12. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He does that daily through renewing our mind like Paul talked about in Romans the key is to slow down, live with balance, allowing God to regularly restore your soul and rest in His peace. The reality is you can take a two-week vacation to Hawaii, Tahiti, Cancun, wherever your dream vacation would be, and you can come back and have the same problems and the same busyness and the same challenges in life because a vacation is not the answer. Resting in God's peace on a daily basis is the answer. 
We readjust our values and we exchange them. We exchange our pressures for what God has for us in life. Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? You might be making great money right now, but is your family healthy? You might be on the fast track in your career, but are you spending enough time with your kids? They're going to be gone in a few years. You rest in God's peace by spending time with God daily, scheduling time to rest and recharge, making sure your family is a priority. Friends, Jesus cares about this in our lives. He cares about every detail of our lives. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. So are you stressed? Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you worn out? Jesus simply says, come to me. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give rest to our weary souls. Father, I pray that through the reading of your word today and the study of your word, that you would challenge us to make adjustments in our lives to line up with you and your word. Father, help us to realign our priorities with your priorities for our lives so we can be better at the jobs you have called us to, so we can be more effective at leading the churches you have called us to, so we could be more effective professors, so we could be examples to those that you've called us to lead of what a balanced life looks like. Resting in you, caring for our family, spending time with you daily. We pray these things in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand together. To see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it costs To see my sin upon that cross And I'll never know how much it costs Have a great afternoon. We'll see you soon.